Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Tursellini, and in this episode, we're going to introduce the topic of embodied carbon and talk about the importance of considering a building's entire life cycle when making design decisions. This last sentence was a mouthful, but don't worry, we will go over these terms and several others that will be used throughout the subsequent episodes. Let's start this discussion by talking about the building sector's contributions to global carbon dioxide emissions. According to a 2021 study by the International Energy Agency, buildings are responsible for about a third of the energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, which is more than any other major sector. Now let's take a closer look at the breakdown of emissions from the building sector. Operational emissions are ones that occur during the operational stage of the building. In other words, once construction is completed and the building is occupied. In general, these operational emissions are associated with using energy in the building as part of its daily operation. This could be purchased electricity, natural gas, oil, etc. The operational stage of a building can be decades to centuries. So this represents a majority of the emissions from the building sector. However, about 20% of the building sector's emissions are embodied. Embodied emissions are attributed to building materials and construction processes. This concept of the embodied environmental impact of buildings is the focus of the next few episodes. One thing to consider, we've spent a lot of time talking about zero energy buildings. As buildings become more efficient, the percentage of embodied emissions compared to the total emissions of the building increases. So if you have a building that uses all carbon free energy, then the operational emissions are close to zero and the carbon footprint is all about the embodied emissions. We can break out the operational emissions into the commercial building sector and the residential building sector. Residential emissions are responsible for a little more than half of the total operation emissions and therefore commercial emissions are a little less than half. During the operation of a residential or commercial building, there are direct emissions and indirect emissions. Direct emissions are emitted on site from the direct combustion of fossil fuels. An example is natural gas burned in a boiler in the building. Direct emissions are coming directly from the building. Indirect emissions are emissions that occur elsewhere, not at the building, but are emitted because of the building needing energy. An example is electricity generation. Using electricity at the building doesn't generate any emissions at the building. However, emissions are generated at the power plant burning fossil fuels. Emissions are also released from the transportation of the fuels, processing those fuels, and the extraction process for gathering the fuels. While not as obvious, it also includes the emissions associated with electricity that is lost between the power plant and the building. In most residential and commercial buildings, indirect emissions makes up the larger portion of the operational emissions. Even as we move to electrify our buildings and replace fossil fuel burning systems with electric heat pumps, we still have these indirect emissions if our electricity is being generated using fossil fuels. If we want to further reduce the emissions related to the building sector, we also need buildings to use electricity generated from carbon-free sources. Carbon emissions are often classified into scope one, scope two, or scope three. This is used as a framework for organizations to categorize and quantify their carbon footprint. Scope one is direct emissions, which we learned about in the last slide. Scope one emissions occur from sources that are controlled or owned by the company. For example, emissions from fuel consumption in boilers, furnaces, or internal combustion engines. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions from purchased energy, which we also just learned about. Scope two indirect emissions are associated with the purchase of electricity, steam, heat, or cooling as a result of the company's energy use. Scope three emissions are a little more complicated. We can define scope three emissions as all indirect emissions, not included in scope two, that occur in the value chain of the company, including both upstream and downstream emissions. We'll give a visual of what this means in the next slide. 
There's a lot behind the scenes happening in order to run a business. They purchase products and services, generate waste, take business trips, and lots more. All of the emissions associated with these business processes have some carbon footprint, which are classified as scope three emissions. An important thing to understand, a company's scope three emissions are somebody else's scope one or two. For example, a company's scope three emissions related to business travel are scope one emissions for the airline. This slide gives a closer look at the types of things that are classified as scope one, two, and three emissions. Upstream activities are processes or goods necessary to run the business, while downstream activities are a result of running the business. We can think of emissions related to upstream activities as inputs to the business and emissions related to downstream activities as the outputs. It's easiest to think of scope one, two, and three emissions in the context of a business. In other words, related to commercial buildings. However, we can also apply the same definitions and concepts to residential buildings. Homeowners have scope one, two, and three emissions also. We have scope one emissions from our fossil fuel powered furnaces, water heaters, and vehicles. We have scope two emissions from the energy we purchase from our utility in order to power our homes. And finally, we have scope three emissions from all the products and services we purchase, the waste we produce, and lots more. According to the 2017 Global Status Report, the global building stock is predicted to double by 2060. This means that between 2017 and 2060, we'll be adding about 2.5 trillion square feet of building floor area in the world. This is equivalent of building one New York City worth of buildings each month for the next 40 years. This also means the carbon emissions from buildings could also double if we do not start becoming more conscious about how we design, construct, and operate buildings. If we go back to the percentages from the IEA study, about 80% of building related emissions in 2021 were attributed to the operational stage. Buildings often operate for decades and sometimes centuries, so this number is understandably large. Therefore, a lot of research has been put into improving our operational efficiency. This leaves the embodied portion of the pie. As we reduce our operational emissions, embodied emissions are becoming more significant and require a bigger focus. It is important to understand that there is a great deal of variability in how embodied emissions are quantified and reported. The numbers presented in these episodes are the average across the entire building sector from the data available, but do not represent each individual building. As the industry works to standardize how embodied emissions are quantified, these percentages can be further refined. In subsequent episodes, we will talk about some of the major considerations when evaluating a building's embodied environmental impacts.